100th time, we're really glad you're here. I want to tell you about a couple ways you can connect in. Come join us on a Sunday morning at 10 o'clock in Crow's Nest or watch us online. We're live on YouTube every Sunday. You can also come a little bit earlier to our prayer meetings. They start at 9.20 here in the building every Sunday. We've got a prayer meeting during the week on a Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock as well. Um, we also have connect groups on Tuesday evenings from 7 o'clock. You can come chat to me. There's groups that meet here in Crow's Nest. There's groups that meet in the NOS. Come chat to me after the service or send us an email and I'll tell you how to get into a group. Um, also, you can come to Encounter Night. It's every second and fourth Friday of the month. And the next one's going to be on the 27th of October, 7 p.m. onwards. It's a beautiful time. We pray and we worship and we seek the face of God. Um, all right, the next thing that you can do is if you call Lighthouse Home and you want to give your tithes and offerings into the house, you can do it here, the details. Um, you don't pay to come to church, but we, pay, but we give our tithe to honour God. Um, all right, now today is a very exciting day. It's Crow's Nest Woo! Festival. So we're going to be celebrating with the community after service. We're going to have our family barbecue. Um, we're going to have the jumping castle in here. We're going to have face painting. We're going to have table tennis next door. Please stay and come along to that. And yes, thank you. And we have the healing tent outside as well. So if you know of anyone who needs healing, or if you want some prayer, feel free. The team's going to be out there. And we're just going to be engaging with our community today. Um, now, next Saturday, we've also got a very exciting day. We've got NCMI New South Wales Equip. So we're hosting all our NCMI friends in, in New South Wales here in our building from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we're having Dale and Angela, our good friends. They're going to be our guest speakers. So come along to that. It is a free event. It is for the equipping of the saints. So bring anyone you know who's keen to hear the Word of God and to be challenged and transformed. All right. Um, that's all I have for you today, guys. We're going to get started right away. Hallelujah. Jesus is glorious. Can we shout Jesus? Can we shout He's glorious? We lift Him up this morning. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Glorious God He is. Woo!
shine, Jesus, shine, Jesus. Shine in this place, Jesus. Shine, Jesus. You shine for all the world to see. You are glorious. Oh, we shine, Jesus. You shine, shine, Jesus. You shine for all the world to see. You are glorious. Oh, Jesus, only Jesus.
captured my heart with this love There's nothing on earth is as beautiful as you Sing this to our God You open, you open my eyes to your wonders of you You captured my heart with this love There's nothing on earth worship you in spirit and in truth.
Jesus in this place. Thank you. 
to the King of Kings. Holy, you will always be.
glorify you this morning Lord we glorify you you will be praised Lord you will be praised you know part of what we do when we praise and worship our King he can't get any bigger bigger or more, more glorious or magnificent than he already is he's infinite in all his ways perfect in all his ways full of glory full of majesty full of splendor but what happens when we praise him in this earthly atmosphere he magnifies Himself, He glorifies Himself in our midst, in our minds, in our hearts. So by experience and by knowing Him, He becomes more glorious in our gathering, in our togetherness. So our praise doesn't change God. Our praise changes the atmosphere. Can you say amen? God is worthy of all our praise. And when we get to heaven, this earthly tent, this mind, these emotions, this soul that we have to deal with, one day you put away and we worship to God face to face in spirit. All the earthly limitations will be gone for we see God who He is face to face. Can you say amen? And today we get the privilege of ministering unto the Lord as if it's already happened, as if we're already in eternity. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? as if we're there already because in His mind we're already there. We're seated in heavenly places by the one sacrifice He's made perfect forever. We draw near to God with full assurance of faith. We come into the throne of grace so we can worship God. 
that remind us that the veil's been torn so we can approach God with confidence. We can see Him. We can honour Him. Can you say Amen? Wonderful. You've got to work, yes. Um, yeah, just as we've been worshipping, I, I was just, saw myself, you know, like, just in front of the throne, and I thought, what does the throne look like? And I don't know, it was led to Revelation 4, but it doesn't actually describe what the actual throne, the chair looks like, which surprised me because I thought it did. And it says, um, you know, John goes, at once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby. I always thought that was the throne it described, but it's not. It's the one who sits there has the appearance of Jasper and Ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the centre, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in the front and in the back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had face like a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. And day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's what we're doing. We are singing, holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. The throne doesn't have to look like anything. It's the person seated on the throne that gives the throne its authority. It's the person seated on that throne that gives it its authority. It's not what the throne looks like. It's who's on the throne. We don't worship the throne. We worship who's on the, on the throne. And the peals of lightning and the thunder that don't come from the throne. They come from the person sitting on the throne. We have an absolutely amazing opportunity to worship right now. That throne will be visible from every part of heaven. But we have the opportunity to lay everything down now and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We sing, Holy, 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 holy. Oh, 
never stop singing, Lord. Never stop singing, Lord. Never stop singing. Can I ask you to lift your hands to heaven this morning? It's a sign of adoration and worship and surrender to Him. Lord, we're here for you this morning. You are the one we worship. You are the one we adore. You are the one all heaven rejoices and sings holy, holy, holy. Lord, we respond to your majesty, your splendor, and your glory this morning. We love you. We honor you. We praise you, Lord, with everything we have, everything we do, with everything we say, Lord. We give you praise, honor, and glory. In your name, Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Can we give a big amen to the Lord this morning? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Woo! Wonderful. Hey, you guys are amazing. Can we thank the band this morning? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was thinking how awesome Jesus is. How many know Jesus is so incredible? Oh, Jesus, so wonderful, so holy, so pure, everything pure and holy and glorious and righteous is wrapped up in who Jesus is. And we have the privilege of worshiping him this morning. One day, we know the Bible is very clear. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We know that day's coming sooner. And it's going to come quicker than I think most of us realize. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Please, Lord, the Spirit and the bride say, come, Lord Jesus. And we get the awesome privilege of participating with Heaven's worship service, you know that. When we gather on a Sunday, the church is joining what's already happening in heaven. <laughs> We're getting ready, absolutely, yes. Getting ready is very important. Part of our getting ready is worshiping. So we can fight. You want to say something? Yeah, okay. Just stand for a sec, sorry, mate. <laughs> um, we got to get ready, yes. And we're blessed to live in this awesome country. I hope you're praying for Australia. Australia needs our prayer. I hope you're praying for the whole world, actually. It's a kind of a bit of a watch and pray situation. Let's not be alarmed. I mean, there's always gonna be wars, earthquakes, pestilence, famines. It's gonna happen. Jesus prophesied it. It's the beginning of birth pangs. The, the end is not yet to come, but we know it is coming. So let's watch and pray. I hope we're watching and praying. And more than watching and praying, because I think some of us can switch off. We've got a bit of fatigue, news fatigue, you know, all the stuff that's happening. We can tend to be very fatigued. But as a church, we shouldn't be fatigued. Our hearts will be soft and tender so we can watch and pray. Because people are coming into the kingdom in unprecedented numbers across our globe. Can you say amen? And God's using all things to work out everything according to His plan and purpose. The deception is that world leaders think they're in control, and they're not in control. <laughs> Newsflash, newsflash, God's still in control and He's working all things out for His plan and purpose. So let's not be freaked out. I think we can get freaked out if we allow our minds to go there. I mean, the tragedy that's happening, is, it's, it's overwhelming, to be honest. But let's just take a step back. And God doesn't want us to work everything out and fix everything. He's got a plan. He's working it out. Our job is to watch and pray, and as Dennis said, get ready. Watch and pray and get ready. And keep on the main thing. Can you say amen? amen. No, I didn't plan to say any of that. But anyway, let's move on very quickly. What I wanted to say is how incredibly blessed we are with the, the musicians we have in our church. Amen. Honestly. Yeah, come on. And Lona, where's Lona? She's not here. When Lona comes back, Lona and Zoe will stand up and honor them. But there's one thing you can play music well. And I've grown up all my life playing music and I appreciate music played well because there's no other option if you play it not well. <laughs> no, 
It's either you do it well or you don't. This is Lorna, come over here. Lorna and Zoe, stand up. Let's honor these guys leading the team. Yeah, come on, let's honor them. Yeah. <laughs> And it's not easy what they do, and, and Lorna's got the brunt of it. It's not easy. The thing about musicians is they're very temperamental, yeah? <laughs> it depends what day you catch them on. <laughs> it's, uh, musicians have their own world, their own language, so it's hard to lead musicians. But we're so blessed. So we not only do music well, which I think th this morning sounded exceptionally well. I mean, where's Art? Art, you're, you're a genius on that thing, bro, so honestly. Amazing, amazing. So not only we sound well, which I think is important, but we're anointed. How we play attracts the presence of God. Because it's not about just playing a set list. It's Lord, we're playing because we want to welcome your presence. So we're super, honestly. And not only that, so we're skillful, we're anointed. But we also flow in the Spirit. Yes. And this is straight up honest. I don't know many churches who have musicians who flow in the Spirit. Right. That's straight up. I'm, it's not a criticism. It's not we're better than anyone else. We've just gone after this intentionally yes. that we're coming. Lord, what are you saying? You're the cloud by day and the fire by night. Lord, we want to follow where you're going. <laughs> not what we're doing. Lord, what are, you, what are you saying? Where are you wanting us to worship you this morning? In what space, in what vista, what are you pouring out this morning? And can I say, that takes intentionality. It doesn't just happen, you wake up one morning as a band, you follow the Spirit. It's not going to happen. <laughs> so I'm going to ask us, in this season, because the devil hates worship to our King. He hates it. Because he wants it. Satan fell because he wanted to be worshipped like God. And he's still going around wanting to be worshipped. He hates it. So let's pray for our team. Lord, keep them pure. Keep them holy. Keep them safe. Keep them close to you. Lord, let them follow you into all that you have for them. Amen. Our worship, what we do, is a big part of what God's doing in our church. Because God inhabits the praises of his people. And God doesn't just come for lip service. <laughs> he comes with his people are hungry for him. Amen? Can we do that? How many are you going to pray for the worship team this week? Yeah, put your hand up if you're going to pray for the worship team. Yeah. Some of you think, put your hand up, you're thinking about praying for the worship team. <laughs> All right, okay, I got you. Phil, come for it, mate. Let's welcome Phil. Actually, welcome Phil and Kerry back. Yeah, we missed you guys. Welcome Joe and Gaz back. We missed you guys as well. And Tim and Sally back. Welcome, yeah. And anyone else, I don't know. <laughs> if you've come back, welcome back, okay? If I missed you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great. Welcome back. Yeah. Ah, oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's well, um, Jim sort of stole on everything I was about to say. I was. <laughs> that's uh, that's all about the word. I was just having a word for the for our worship uh, music team. Actually, our music team that um, prepares themselves and um, they come in here when no one's here and they they pray and they practice and uh, they seek our Lord and they and they ask Him what would He like. This Sunday, what would he like for us to bring him? And then they practice. Practice this present. This present that he wants. And then they, uh, and then they, then they perform it and they grab our hearts. And, um, and then the Lord looks at our heart. You know, it's a heart of worship. It's not about whether we're, you lift your hand up in the air or... Or you jump up and down or you lay on the ground. You, you could be sitting and absolutely have no emotion at all, but your heart's totally involved in worship. And, and, and God doesn't, he's not really interested in, it, in our outward appearance. He is always looking at our heart. 
it's a, it's a hard issue that got you saved and it's a hard issue that you worship with. And I just feel like the Lord really, um, yeah, just <laughs> wants to let you know, you know, like these guys, they, um, they practice and they, and, and it's a big thing and, and it's a, a very important thing and it starts with worship and it ends with worship and, and you know, and Jim's, Jim's, and also I wanted to pray for Jim as well, but he's, um, he's gone somewhere else. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, what's that? Uh, keep going? Okay. Yeah, and, uh, but, um, yeah, it's worship. But then we also have, we have our, um, our preacher, whoever, whoever it may be, comes here on a Sunday. And also, to the same degree, they, they are, um, they're preparing. They're preparing and they're, and they're seeking, seeking God and, and, they're, and he gives them a word. And, they, and then, they, then they put that word down on paper and then they come here and they, and they um, and they deliver it. And so Jim, so we just call Jim up and we'll we'll pray for Jim, eh? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, week in, week out, he's uh, thank you. Thank you. he's here. And he's, mm, it's not easy, not easy um, preparing a uh, preparing a word. And, um, you know, a couple of times I. I've had to do it, and um, and I've driven around in my car and think, oh yeah, I'll say that, and I'll say, yeah, it's sweet, it'll be a beauty, and 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 you and you sit down with our Lord and you, and you start to pray, and that all goes, and you, and then then it's a whole time of just my God, you know, just really um, falling on your face and and crying out to Him, and then He just rearranges you, and then after a period of time, then He starts it starts to flow again, but it, this man does it nearly every week. <laughs> And uh, we, we just want to honour you, Jim, and um, we just want to pray for you that uh, you have been away, you've seeked our Lord, and, and he's given you a word. And, and that's what we, we need to realise, that this is not just something that uh, Jim's just come up with. He's actually, this, this has actually come from God, and, and, uh, and this is what God wants us to hear, and this is what's going to sustain us um, from week to week and year to year. And we really need to believe that. And we just pray for Jim. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for Jim, Lord. And lift him up to you. We just ask you to bless him, Lord, and just fill him with your presence. We just pray, Lord, that you give him the strength in his body to, to keep walk, marching on for you, Lord, and just keep seeking you. And we just pray that, um, that you always encourage him, Lord, just to keep going, keep going, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. One, two. Well, thank you for that. Appreciate it. And sorry for stealing your, your thunder there, Philly. For <laughs> All good. Wonderful. Well, who's ready to hear the Word of God this morning? I can, uh, fighting, uh, I think, a losing battle because uh, as a sausage sizzle starts to cook, <laughs> I think your attention's going to spare a wane away. <laughs> anyway, I'll do my best. Um, we're in the series of Ephesians, Truth, starting on the book of Ephesians. So I said the last couple of a week or so ago, all our information, outlines, study plans, reading plans, sermon uh, notes, are all going to be on our website. And you, who wants to shout out our website information? No one. Wow. Thelighthouse.org.au. Awesome. Listen to the podcast. Yes. YouTube, it's all there. It's a resource to equip us. That we can, as Phil said, we can just hear and receive. And so last week we started part one. This is part two. Don't know how long we're going to take to get through Ephesians. We could probably stay in the book of Ephesians until Jesus returns, to be honest with you. But we're not going to do that. But there's so much in there. I mean, every line, every word can be a whole sermon, honestly. Paul, the apostle, the author of, of the book of Ephesians, jam packed so much truth and revelation in those six chapters that we could spend all eternity to bring it out. And... Um, the best preacher in the whole world will not do the book of Ephesians justice because we are, after all, talking about the Word of God. Can you say amen? And the Bible says the Word of God effectively works in you, effectively works in you, if you believe it. You know, it's not just, uh, just some blanket thing that we kind of use as a good luck charm and we just keep our Bibles with us or whatever. No, we actually got to believe it. We got to put it into practice. As we do that, it begins to work in, in your life. 
The Bible says the, that the Word of God itself is like seed. And if you think about seed, what are you going to do to seed to make it fruitful? Stare at it? Carry it around with you? <laughs> Take photos on Instagram and snap it? Whatever, I don't know. What, how's a seed going to work? You've got to plant it. So for us, how's the Word of God going to work? Now? You've got to plant it. You've got to receive it in your heart. You've got to make sure your heart's in the right place uh, to receive it, believe it, put it into practice. And we've got the privilege of doing that this morning with, in the book of Ephesians. Turn to the person next to you and say, you ready to study the book of Ephesians? So we've gone through the outline already. We've kind of covered the big picture of the book of Ephesians. And now we're going to get through and do our best to go through line upon line, all six chapters. Please pray for us, because it's an impossible task, but we'll do our best. Can you say amen? Um, so today we have the privilege of going through the first part of chapter 1, Ephesians 1 to 14. But before we do that, our foundational text is John 1, 16 to 17. And I'm going to ask my wife to come and read that text to us. Let's welcome Maria Nestoris all the way from Winston Hills. For out of his fullness, abundance, we have all received, all had a share, and we were all supplied with one grace after another, and spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, and even favour upon favour, and gift heaped upon gift. For while the law was given through Moses, grace, which is unearned, undeserved, undeserved favour, and spiritual blessing and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, the New Testament was written not to confuse us or to make us jump through more hoops. How many know that the Old Testament has how many laws? 613 laws. There's enough hoops in the Old Testament for us to jump through. You know what I mean? So the New Testament wasn't given, so there's more hoops for us to jump through. The New Testament was written to show us our incredible position in Christ, to give us confidence to approach this holy, awesome God who we're singing about. Because without understanding the gospel, there's no way you would ever earn or merit the right to approach this holy, righteous, just God. The gospels and the New Testament is written to give us Clarity and confidence to approach God with, with surety of our salvation. Can you say amen? Now, Christianity is the only religion, if you call it a religion, that gives its members or its constituents a surety, assurance of salvation. All other religions, somehow, somewhere, you have to earn, and you never know when you've done enough to earn. You've prayed enough, where you've given enough, you've gone to the right places, your posture's correct, eaten the wrong things, eaten the right things, said the right things, said the wrong things. So you're constantly living in this perpetual state of condemnation and guilt and fear because you don't know in what kind of mood you're going to approach God when you die. Christianity throws all that by the wayside. <laughs> we have good news. Why is it good news? Because of Jesus, we know God, His disposition towards us is favorable. We have grace to approach Jesus and fa the Father. Can you say amen? And you can have today, you can have assurance of your salvation. Not when you die, today. Today you can know your Father in heaven. You can, your spirit can become born again. You can see the kingdom today. Because <laughs> you're going to hear the gospel, and the Bible says you can repent, which is turn away from your sin, and you can believe in the good news. You turn away to go toward, yeah? Repentance is like a door, yeah? Repentance and faith is like the gateway. So repentance opens the door, faith Closes the door and says, I'm in now, God. I repented, came in, faith closed the door for me. Amen. You can't have one without the other. And we can talk about it a bit later. But anyway, today we're talking about the book of Ephesians. I'm doing my best to cover 
some main points. It's actually impossible for us to cover everything that's in there, but let's do our best, yeah? How many excited about the book of Ephesians? How many of you started reading the book of Ephesians? Yeah, awesome, awesome. Encouraging the groups, as families, when you get together with other believers, let's talk about, hey God, what, what, what is God saying to you out of the book of Ephesians? You'll be surprised. God speaks very clearly to us. Anyway, Ephesians 1 verse 3 is our key verse. It says, blessed, actually I ask you to memorize it. So let's turn that off, see if we can say it without reading it. Ready? Can we go blank? Uh, version New King James. You ready? <laughs> it's tricky. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Can you say amen? amen. <laughs> you did well. Well done. Well done. <laughs> well done. Okay, let's go straight into the text. Ephesians 1, verse 1, right through to 14. We're going to read it. Let me know there's power in reading the Word of God. There's power in allowing the Word of God to penetrate into your heart. I'm not a big fan of little sermonettes, 15-minute preachers, five-minute preachers. Not that they're bad. It's because the Word of God is so rich, and we face so many battles, and we face opposition and unbelief and bullying and intimidating spirits. That five-minute preach, I think it's not going to cut it. It doesn't cut it for me. I need hours of spending time in the Word. I need hours to spend time in God's presence so I can have the strength and the resources to push back as opposition comes. Can you say amen? We're called to be men and women of faith, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It doesn't come by watching hours and hours on TV or Netflix or Stan, whatever else you watch. I'm not anti those things, but faith doesn't come by those things. And you wake up tired, more tired than you went to fell asleep because you spent hours watching TV. I'm not anti that. There's time and place for everything. But for us as believers, we need to live ready. You don't know when God's going to ask you to use your faith to push back something of the, the darkness that's hitting our planet. You don't know when you're going to go to work and someone's sick and they need a miracle and they come to you desperate. It's too late to say, come back in six months when I build my faith up. Amen. We need to live ready. I love what Dennis is saying. Let's live ready. How do we live ready? Well, let's get into the Word. Let's study the Word. Let's feast on the Word. So then no matter what comes our way, we're ready because God's spoken to us. He's nourished us. He's strengthened us. How many of you have tried to go to the gym without eating? How many of you have tried to go to the gym full stop? <laughs> <Question>. <laughs> It's hard enough to get to the gym, but you better make sure you've eaten your breakfast or had some meals because you're about to use some energy, so you better have some stores energy there, and I've got lots of stored energy, don't worry, I've got <laughs> But you need to push back, you need to resist what's coming your way, then you need to be able to be strong to resist what's coming your way. If we're not in the Word, we're just going to receive everything that is from the Lord. Unbelief, oh, God just wants me to be miserable. No peace full of stress, full of worry. No, you've got to push back sometimes. Yes, I'm not going to take that worry. It's not mine. I'm not going to take that fear. It doesn't belong to me. Yeah. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You need to push back some of those other things. Can you say amen? Well, this is what the book of Ephesians teaches us to do. Out of who God is and what He's done, it shows us our identity and our inheritance. We get to live in this privileged position as sons and daughters of the King because of what God has done through Jesus by the Holy Spirit on the cross. Can you say amen? And Paul brilliantly packages all that truth together and gives us insight into the plans and the mystery and the purposes of God so we can live strong, mature, uh, holy lives for Jesus. Can you say amen? Jesus is coming back for a spotless and pure bride, not an apathetic, sick, tired bride. Can you say amen? We deserve to give Jesus the best of us, not the worst of us. Yeah? We deserve to give Jesus all that's in us because he purchased our lives for us. Can you say amen? This is a word for some of the husbands. Before you were married, you used to look the best, try to be in the best shape, and I'm talking to myself. <laughs> 
brush your teeth every now and then, use some deodorant, shave or whatever. And now you're married, you think you don't have to do anything to impress your wives anymore. And say, no, you need to give your wife your best, especially now you're married. Even more so now you're married. Not your worst, give her your best. When you come home tired from work, don't expect to be served. You serve your wife and your children. All the wives, you should have said amen. (laughs) Settle down, settle down. (laughs) And we think we we can just get away with giving God our leftovers, you know? So I'm busy, I've got no time to read the Bible, I've got no time to pray, I've got no time to worship, but I've got all the time to eat and see my friends and go on social media and watch TV. And I get to bed half dead at 10.30 at night and I give God 30 seconds and I fall asleep. And they go, that's good, God understands. It's grace, right? We're saved by grace. Yeah, 100% you're saved by grace. But now grace empowers you to live holy for Jesus, to live in love with Him, not to add Him on as an optional extra. And God's coming back for a spotless, pure bride who lay aside everything, who recognize that Jesus is the pearl of great price. They forsake everything to follow Him. Can you say amen? This is what the book of Ephesians does. It shows us how great our God we serve. And uh, I've taken too long with that introduction. Okay, let's read. You ready? Chapter 1, verse 1 to 14. I'm going to read it. Read along with me. We ready? Loud voice. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He has accept, made us, sorry, in the Beloved. <laughs> I stuffed up there. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, which He made abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in Him. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him, who works out all things according to the counsel of His will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also trusted after heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Come on! (laughs) That is God's word. God's word, holy, holy word. God has, God's word has power to raise the dead. <laughs> God's word has power to bring dead people to life. Can you say amen? amen? Let's get stuck straight into it. Verse one, Paul, the apostle. Now I don't want to get stuck here, but... <laughs> Notice what Paul doesn't say. He doesn't call himself the Apostle Paul. Well, think, what's the big deal, Jim? Are you just semantics? You're just making a big deal out of nothing. No, it's very intentional. Paul doesn't call himself the Apostle Paul. (laughs) Paul calls himself, I am Paul, who is an apostle. Very different. And I tell you what happens Lies and half-truths and religious tradition creeps into the church and we just gobble it all up. But my encouragement to you, let's go back to the Scriptures. 
Our, wor- our faith is based on God's Word and God's Word alone. One of our core values as a church, if it's in the Bible, we want it. If it's not in the Bible, we're going to get rid of it. Doesn't matter who says what, what tradition, what man, what institution, what organization claims anything other than what's in the Scriptures. If it's not in there, we're not going to do it. Why? Because the Bible is our final authority. Not some traditional denomination, and I'm not anti any of those things. I'm just anti things that are not in the Bible. Now, it's not our job to correct everyone. We're not the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Our job is to live the Word. Now, Paul intentionally doesn't put a title before his name. Why? Because the gospel has made every one of us equal. (laughs) Now, if you start putting titles in front of people's names, you're elevating humans above other humans. And it's not in the Bible. I challenge you to find anywhere in the New Testament where any of the apostles, any of the pastors, any of the prophets put a title in front of their name. It doesn't exist. It's a Western add-on to the culture. It's culturally acceptable to call someone pastor someone. It's not in the Bible. Thank you, Robert. (laughs) Well, let me take the argument further. If that's the truth, I've got to call him Engineer Rob. So I put his function before his, t- before his name. Doesn't exist. What's the big deal? It's big because it creates hierarchical thinking in the church. And the church isn't an organization, it's a family. <laughs> now, I'm not going to sit there. If you call me Pastor Jim, I'm not going to correct you, okay? That's not my job. But hopefully you'll go to the Scriptures and say, okay, let's have a scriptural approach to this. Actually, Jesus said it. Don't call anyone. You going to say something? Don't let anyone call you. Yeah, so we can take it a bit further. We can actually enforce our rights almost. But I think we we, we create kind of stuff that's not there. Anyway, the, the point is this. Scripture doesn't put titles, uh, function as titles. It doesn't exist. Now, what people do out there, it's their business. As for me and our house, we're going to build scripturally. <laughs> See, pastoring is what I do, not who I am. Because one day I'm not going to pastor, yeah? <laughs> when we get to heaven, you're not going to need pastors or worship leaders <laughs> or teach us. When we get to heaven, we're going to be worshiping Jesus on our face. Amen. <laughs> Paul, an apostle. Now, he didn't dismiss. See, the, the flip side of that is, well, you're not important. No, Paul didn't say what I do is not important. He's saying it doesn't define me and you shouldn't create hierarchical structures in the church. So let's keep it honest. Let's keep it relational. Let's keep it truthful. Let's recognize gifts. That's the other flip side is that we think everyone's equal and we are equal, but we have different functions. So we recognize people's anointing. We recognize the call of God on people's lives. Not you have to promote yourself. (laughs) Others recognize the call of God on you. Not you print out business cards and say, now you're apostle X, Y, Z, because you want to be Apostle X, Y, Z. You won't find it anywhere. And people give me their cards all the time. I'm evangelist this, prophet this, apostle this. I say, God bless you. But that doesn't mean you're called by God. Can you say amen? Amen. Let me see the fruit in your life. Let me see what your calling has produced. Let me see your track record. Paul said, you call me apostle, but look at my track record. Because you can call yourself whatever you want. It doesn't mean it's who you are. I told you I was going to get stuck, yeah? <laughs> Jim, this is not important. Let's get back to preaching the gospel. I tell you, it's part of the gospel. Because if we don't understand it, it creates hierarchical. Wow. Moving on. I knew it was going to be quiet. <laughs> Good? 
Happy? We're still friends? So that's good, Pastor. No, don't say it. <laughs> that's good. I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> Next. This is another one I get stuck on. <laughs> okay, Paul addresses, he writes, he writes to the church and he calls them saints. Again, I'm not here to attack other churches. Because they're not our, they're God's people, yeah? But somehow along the line, religious tradition has brought in saints to mean something else than what the Bible says it means. And Paul here is writing to alive saints, not dead people somewhere that we have to remember them. He's writing to a living church, and he calls those people saints. It's important for us to understand that there's a distinction. Now, we all call saints, and there's reasons for that. I don't want to go into that. But the Bible doesn't elevate one saint above any other saint. We're all saints. Can you say amen? What qualifies someone to be a saint is someone who has surrendered their life to Jesus. <laughs> someone who simply has trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you are a born again believer this morning, not you go to church, not you're part of some denomination, in your heart, if you've made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you've repented and confessed him as a Lord, the Bible calls you a saint. <laughs> and again, if we understand the gospel, we're all in this together. And religious tradition wants to elevate other people above other people. And again, I'm not anti those things, but we don't see it in the scriptures. <laughs> Let's go back to the scriptures. Actually, the, saint, the word means a set apart one. That's all it means. So a saint is someone who's been set apart, someone who was part of this earthly world system, but now because of their faith in Christ, they've been set apart. They're no longer part of this world. They belong to the set apart ones called the church. <laughs> they call, God calls those people saints. That's why we go for the saints. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one song we're singing in heaven. It's when the saints go marching in. Everybody else is. <laughs> These ordinary people that Paul's writing to hadn't achieved any realm of success in the kingdom. They're ordinary men and women like you and me, but they've been set apart by believing the promise of salvation. They believed in Christ, therefore became faithful saints in Christ. These people were not saved by faithful living, but rather they put their trust in the faithful Christ who saved them. It's very clear teaching. Back to the Bible. The Bible teaches on and on again. The saints are the called out believers who follow Jesus. Turn to the person next to you and say, welcome to church, you saint. <laughs> Okay, we've covered one verse already. We're doing all right. <laughs> next one. Okay, this next one. We're really going to have to skip it, but it's so much in there. We read Paul's introduction. Paul's introduction to all his letters. His favorite saying was, grace and peace to you from our Lord, from our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't just something he thought sounded nice. There was a meaning and purpose behind it, and it's really a gospel greeting. It became known in the early church as a way to greet brothers and sisters. Grace and peace to you. Like we would say, God bless you or blessings. Paul coined this phrase, grace and peace to you. Grace and peace to you from the Lord, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We won't have time to go into it. Please read it in your own time. All my notes will be on our website. You can go through and unpack it yourself. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we spend too much time in some of these little verses, we're going to get lost. Okay. Next one, which we really want to spend the rest of our time with is verse 3 to 14. This is called a doxology. Doxa in Greek is glory. Ology is to talk. So Paul's just giving glory to God as he's talking. Doxology is giving glory to God. And actually in the Greek, verse 3 to 14 is all one sentence. It's all Paul's attempt 
to give glory all back to God because of what happened on the cross, who God was, who Jesus is, and what the Holy Spirit did. Paul did his best to articulate it, and he used one sentence. So if you think I talk a lot in one sentence, Paul, it's the cake, right? And he unpacks this incredible truth of who God is, what he has done, and what that means for you and me. And it actually launches and sets us up for the rest of the book of Ephesians. And if we understand these 11 verses, whatever they are, 12 verses, whatever they are, 11 verses, we really will be blessed. Maybe our key verse is we've been blessed in spiritual, uh, in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus already, with all blessing. I encourage you today, whatever you need from the Lord, Jesus has already purchased for you in heaven. In God's mind, Jesus has already blessed you with every spiritual blessing. Do you need wisdom today? Sally, you need some wisdom. Guess where wisdom's gonna come from? The every spiritual blessing from high. You need patience. You need joy. You need grace. You need some perseverance. Where's it gonna come from? From every spiritual blessing that has already been given to us in Christ Jesus. Can you say amen? So the whole thing, the summary is, he has blessed us, God. He's the source of our blessing. Not your job, not where you live, not your church, not your pastor, not your spouse, not who you're married to, not what kind of car you drive, what kind of job you have. God is the source of life and everything else you need. He is the source. Paul makes it very clear. Next, it's the scope, every spiritual blessing. In other words, he is the source, but also he's given us access to the whole scope of blessing. And we think Western material thinking in blessing. We think money, houses, holidays, all those kind of things. And in Paul's mind, none of that ex- <laughs> existed. He's talking about spiritual blessings. The most important blessing you can receive are those you receive in the Spirit. Because you receive it in the Spirit, then it begins to work out in your life. Amen. Just for example, healing, I believe, because it's in the atonement, is a spiritual blessing. Because Jesus, by his stripes, you were healed. Isaiah 53, by his stripes you were wounded, you were healed. So now you receive, out of that sense of spiritual blessing, the scope, you receive it into your natural world. How? Out of that place of spiritual blessing. Number three, it's in the heavenly realms. Paul instructs us to live out of this heavenly realms. Even though we have a physical body, we have a soul, mind, will, and emotion, Paul always appeals to our spirit man, our real, the real us. The one that's gonna outlast the sands of time is the spirit that's inside of you, You're the real you. Remember trying to teach this truth to the kids as they were growing up, saying, we, you know, we have a body, it's like a tent, we live in the body, but it's not really ours. It's ours, but it's not really our permanent home. We have a home. Our real us is our spirit. And they'll say, well, show me. Where is it? (laughs) Well, if I was to show you, then I wouldn't be around anymore. So maybe you shouldn't be asking that, okay? (laughs) But the real us is is the spirit us. And so much of our world puts ascendancy on on our flesh, on our body, on our mind, on our intellect, on our thinking. And Paul puts the focus always back to the spirit. Out of that spiritual realm, he wants you to live. Receiving that spiritual blessing, you can be encouraged and empowered to live out the life God wants you to live on this planet. Can you say amen? And Paul unpacks this very skillfully. We're gonna summarize quickly and we're gonna move on. So Paul is the, uh, the father is the source all life comes from him. So I just one more bath. Thank you, Tish. Let's thank the guys at the back. Thank you, guys. The Father is, has given us everything we need in the heavenly realms. Peter says that we've, um, uh, what is he saying? First Peter, someone find that quote. That we have everything that we need for life and godliness. It's a similar saying. So everything you need for your life, God has made provision for it in the heavenly realms for you. Our problem is we live too conscious of the earthly realm and we don't live aware, we don't have faith to enter into the heavenly realm and receive what God's pouring out for us. 
Our hope is through reading the book of Ephesians, we enter those heavenly realms with Christ through the scriptures and by the Spirit, and we receive what He's already given us. And we live in the reality of the truth of these heavenly realms. Can you say amen? amen. In the sphere. So the Christian's life is centered in heaven. It's so easy to get awed by what's happening around our planet, earthquakes and famines and wars and referendums and, oh no, I said the R word in church. <laughs> I'm tired of being awed by humanity. I wanna be awed by God. And God wants His people to be awed by Him. So we need to live out of this place, our sphere of influence is first heaven. <laughs> Do you find your satisfaction in heaven? Do you find your sense of peace out of that realm before you try and exist in this realm? Our citizenship is in heaven. So we're ambassadors, we're passing through. <laughs> it's like we're in transit, I've talked about this before. It's like we're in the airport lounge in transit waiting for our plane to come. And we wonder why we're uncomfortable. We wonder why things are not making sense. We wonder why we have to sleep on the couch and get sore necks because we haven't arrived at our destination yet. We're in transit. Our citizenship is in heaven. Things aren't going to make sense until we get to heaven because that's when all things will begin to make sense. And right now, things are not making sense on our planet. I can't reconcile. You can't reconcile what's happening at the moment in the Middle East. No one can. But this is for sure. One day, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And God's working it out. He doesn't need your permission or your perspective to carry out His plan, yeah? Our job is to say, Lord, what are you doing? It's watch and pray. Watch and pray. Our names are written in heaven. Remember the story where the disciples went out and they saw demons come out of people and people got healed and raised and set free and they started rejoicing. And it's great and God's gonna do that more and more in our midst. People are gonna go out in the healing tent and they're gonna come back saved, healed and delivered. Praise the Lord. You're gonna get to work one day. There's gonna be revival. You're gonna come back and say, praise the Lord. Come on. But Jesus always brought us back to heaven. He said, okay, that's great what's happening, but don't rejoice in those things. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Come on. <laughs> that's our sphere. Our Father is in heaven. The Father in heaven who loves us, welcomes us in his presence every day. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's our sphere. We need to do life out of that place. Our inheritance is in heaven. Again, all these things could be a message on their own. Jesus said, don't, you know, store up treasures for you on earth where rust can come in and moth can come and destroy. Don't come and just hoard and live for today. And it's important, obviously, you have food on your table and you're able to be a blessing. But Jesus said, don't put your trust in worldly riches. Don't think they're gonna save you. Don't think they're your source of joy. <laughs> Why? Because we have an inheritance reserved in heaven for us that cannot spoil, cannot fade, is unblemished, forever reserved for you and me. We spend so much of our life wanting to bring heaven to earth, and that's our prayer, right? God, let your will be done on, on earth as it is in heaven. But how about we live conscious of what's waiting in heaven for us? Because that way, the earth and its appeal will get less and less. Amen? Amen. We live so conscious of our world and so unconscious of the heavenly realms, we wonder why there's a disconnect. God wants us to live so conscious of the heavenly realm that we take that revelation and that encounter we've experienced with Him and what we know of Him, that it impacts this earthly realm. Yeah. <laughs> 
you know, I want to walk into a situation, walk into hospitals, walk into people's rooms that are riddled with cancer. I want to walk into people who have given up on life. And I want to carry the very atmosphere in heaven into that situation. Can you say amen? Well, that's not going to happen if we live in conscious and aware just of this earthly realm. God's calling us upward to take us deeper so our sphere can be wider. Can you say amen? (laughs) That we carry that everywhere we go. Come on, in the book of Acts, Peter's shadow... As he's walking by, people were lying on a mattress, on a pallet, crippled. His shadow would go past. Where's my shadow? I've got no shadow. Am I really here? I've got no shadow. Oh, there it is. His shadow will go past. Come on. He's not even praying. Such was the atmosphere of heaven he's carrying. It permeated his whole being. He's walking in such an awareness of his heavenly inheritance. He's walking walking in such an awareness of he's blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus that it's affecting the world around him. (laughs) Now, that's not going to happen one day on its own. We live intentionally in the secret place. We're consumed with his passion because we're in love with him. And it changes, transforms the way we minister and live. Can you say amen? Henry the seven, and that's what Colossians 3 talks about. Uh, our, our attention, affection, all to be centered on that. Next slide, please. Okay, we're going to be finishing very shortly. Here's a bit of a summary now of this next passage. So the Godhead slash Trinity does not work independently because they all work together to make our salvation possible. In actual fact, any major event, creation, formation of Israel, through the history of the Bible, it's always Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's not always revealed in the Old Testament because Jesus was concealed in the Old Testament until the time would come, it was unlocked, The revelation of Jesus came. Now Jesus is revealed as part of the Godhead. But Jesus always existed not as Jesus, but as the Son of God, pre-New Testament. I hope you believe that. He was their creation. (laughs) The beauty is they all work and they all have their part in our salvation and in our ongoing ministry. So each person has a special ministry to perform or special spiritual deposit to make in our lives. And Ephesians brings out this incredible truth, and we're going to unpack that very shortly. Next slide, please. We're almost done. All right. If I can have your attention for two minutes, put your phones down, Bibles down, and you've got to read this with me. This will change your life. This will give us so much insight into how holy and righteous and perfect God is that we just want to live in awe of Him for the rest of our life. The summary of Ephesians is, as far as God is concerned, you were saved when He chose you in Christ before the creation of the world in eternity past. Remember, God is outside time and space. In God's mind, Jesus was crucified before the earth even began. That's the God we're dealing with. Now in God's mind, he chose you to be son and daughter before the world existed. (laughs) Can you believe that? But that alone doesn't save you. Because it's God's will that none shall perish. And God doesn't sit there playing, I choose you, I choose you, but I don't choose you, I don't choose you. Remember last week we learned about divine sovereignty and human responsibility. God has chosen you. (laughs) He's already chosen you. (laughs) But that alone doesn't save you. This is good 
solid doctrine and theology. Because there's lots of junk out there, universalism and other things where, okay, we're all saved. We don't have to do anything. We're all going to make it to heaven because God chose everyone. The Bible does not teach that. So keep that thought in mind. In eternity past, God says, I see you, Craig, and I choose you, mate. And I'm going to send my son, but even before you're born, he's going to come and die for you. <laughs> so as far as God the Son is concerned, you were saved when he died on the cross for you and was raised to life for you. <laughs> That's when the payment was transacted. So God had a plan. In his mind, it's already happened. He waited through creation, through all the Old Testament, the birthing of Israel, all through to Malachi, waiting patiently, and his mind has chosen you. Jesus comes, and now he transacts the payment for your salvation. So as far as Jesus is concerned, his blood is already paid for your salvation. For past, present, eternity. <laughs> Can you just begin to grasp how enormous this is? But that alone does not save you. As far as the Spirit is concerned, you are actually saved. If indeed you are saved this morning. Not that I want to put doubt in your mind. Is that you need to know, not me. You need to know you're saved. When you yielded your life to Jesus, when you repented from your sin, when you believed on him as your Lord and Savior, that's when you were rebirthed. That's when you were regenerated. That's when you were sealed. When you chose to believe. That's the way we come into the kingdom. That's the way we live in the kingdom. God has plans for you. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you a hope and to a future. I know that's talking about Jerusalem. But my name's Jimmy, and I take all the peace God can give me. Can you say amen? God has a plan for your life, for your marriage, for your finances for your career, for where you live, for your ministry. God has a plan. <laughs> God's not this random force somewhere in the ether of the universe by chance things happening. No, that's not God. God is a meticulous planner. Every day he's been thought out. It's there. Now in Christ, we have access because Jesus paid the price to give us an inheritance so we can action those plans, so we can come in and receive them. But they're lying in heaven for you, waiting in those heavenly realms. And God set it up on purpose that way because it's not once you become a child, you get all your inheritance. No, God wants a relationship. What happens when you get an inheritance too early, the kids get spoiled. Some parents, watch what you give your kids. <laughs> That's waiting in heaven. And God, through relationship, through unpacking truth, by our faith, wants us to receive what he has for us. How do we do that? By the power of the Holy Spirit. He helps us to live in that realm where we see and we receive and we walk in our inheritance. Can you say amen? This is what Ephesians brings out with such focus and clarity. Can you say amen? We're going to read last amen and we're done. So the president of the U.S. is not always seated at his desk in the White House. But that executive chair, that seat, represents the seat of his power no matter where he is. He is 
the president. Because only he has the privilege of sitting at the desk. There's a name for it. It's called the resolute desk. Reserved only for the president. Likewise, the Christian, turn to the person next to you and say, that's you. No matter where you may be on earth, no matter what you're going through, no matter what season in life you are in, you are seated in heavenly places with Christ. <laughs> That's a good news. And that forms the basis of our relationship and our authority and our power that we get to walk in, that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Can you say amen? And we get to live out that incredible truth. And we're going to do that in the next few weeks. We get to unpack some of those truths. Next slide and we're done. That was the last statement. Now it's the last slide. These are the blessings from the Father. He chose us. He adopted us. He accepted us. <laughs> blessings from the Son. He redeemed us. He's forgiven us. He's revealed God's will to us. And He's made us an inheritance. <laughs> And blessings from God the Spirit, He has sealed us and given us an earnest or a deposit guaranteeing our future inheritance in Him. Can you say amen? These are all in those 11 verses, which is called the doxology. Paul unpacks this incredible truth of the Godhead, who they are and what they've done, and it positions us for the, next, uh, the rest of the letter to live that out for, for our benefit and for our inheritance. Can you say amen? We're going to leave it there. Again, it's going to be all on the website, all our notes. I mean, I've just jumped through, touched through very few things this morning, uh, but it's all there. I encourage you, go through it. Make it your commitment to the Lord. Not to me because I'm saying it. Obviously, I want to encourage you to do it because I know you'll be blessed. But use it as, as your devotional time to the Lord. Study the Word. Go into some of these Scriptures. Memorize them. Speak them over your life. You wake up tomorrow morning, so I don't feel blessed this morning, Lord. I feel a bit yuck, and I feel weak, and I don't feel like I'm a Christian. Well, go back. Lord, thank you that you've blessed me. Thank you that you've forgiven me. Thank you that I'm redeemed in you. Thank you you've chosen me. I'm accepted in the beloved. And you start speaking, start living that out. It changes the way you live on your life. Can you say amen? Yeah? Why don't we stand and pray? Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that your word is forever settled in heaven. Thank you that you've given us your word so we can know you, that we can have fellowship with you, so that we can live as your sons and daughters in this world, conscious of our inheritance in heaven, of our identity as your sons and daughters, so we can live conscious of heaven, so we can affect the world around us, Lord God. Father, help us, give us strength, Give us wisdom. Speak to us through your word this week, Lord. Father, I pray for our connect groups. I pray for us as we get together as your church that we'll dig into the scriptures. We'll dig into the book of Ephesians, Lord. That we'll feed off your word. That we'll understand our inheritance. That you will lead us into all truth. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening.